uh, we had 1,400 coupons for the beers. And at the end of the party, we were left with none. So I assume the party was good. Um, so probably it's not a good question for today morning, but I would like to ask you, how many of you run in your life? Like, try to catch the tram. Oh, there is a few. How many of you are, is running um, on a regular basis? Like, let's say, la once a month. Oh, there are still a few. How about once a week? Twice a week? All right, so I'm going to talk today about, um, if I get my clicker to work, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own story because for on every presentation uh, training that I had, uh, I, was, I was taught that I should share some personal experience and the stories. And most of my stories, are not really good for the conferences. They are better for like, like yesterday party. Um, but this is something that I may probably have some connection with the work and some, some, some real stuff. So I was trying to get a little bit fitter and lose some weight and I decided I would like to get into running. And every time I tried, I end up with some problems. I end up with my, usually it was knees, pains or some other injuries, uh, but every time I tried different shoes, different pads, different pace, I end up with problems. So at some point, after three years of trying, I, I decided that it's, it's not good for me. It's not my sport, and then I gave up. And so it happens that I had some injury, did I lose? Yeah. I had some injuries on skiing, and I had to go to the doctor, to the professionalist, and he said, to fix your leg, you need to exercise. And running is pretty good, but before you got to run, you need to start walking first. So he said, using the wrong shoes, you doing this too quickly, and you are really not prepared for running yet. So I'm sharing this story with you because this is something which um, I would like to connect with the continuous delivery. So continuous delivery in my mind is something that helps you to have sustainable pace and deliver iteration after iteration and release after release with some better quality or with some better stuff. Will this work better? Okay, is it better now? Um, so now I have a clicker and a microphone, so if, I, if you see me waving, then it's, it's because I have too many, too many gadgets on me, which is, which is my usual state. So going back to the story, um, I, during this exercise, I learned that you need to have the right tools, and in this case, it was, it was shoes, and you need to have the right process. You need to know what are your limits? And you need to know what, you, what you're trying to achieve. Because if you're trying to achieve more than your limits and you are not prepared for it, your, pretzel, your process, your tools, or your health is not, not good enough, you're going to fail. You're going to break something. You can break a leg, or you can have your team to leave, or you can have you know, your build to crash, or your release to go bad in production. And the last thing is having somebody to going to help you and having somebody to tell, which tells you um, stop doing what you're doing, do something else, or keep doing what you're doing. You don't see the results yet, but at some point you will get some, some good output of it. <clears throat> the, 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 today I would like to talk a little bit about what continuous delivery is, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I'm sure you all know a little bit about it, or a lot, or even more than I do. But I would like to talk about how to implement it when you don't have the tools in place, when you didn't start from the clean sheet, when you didn't uh, have the opportunity to build it from the beginning, but you ac acquired something. You have a legacy code, you have a big team, you, have, you don't have no automation, or you have other problems that you want to fix. So how to, how to do it in a way that you will get to the end state, uh, but during the process you're not going to break something, you're not going to hurt yourself. So before I go there, I have one more question for you. 
when you think about a release, when you think about go live or going to production or shipment, whatever you call it, is this picture represents what you feel about it? Or maybe this one? So which one is on the easy one? I see one hand, I see two hands. That's great, I don't see, I don't see the balcony, but let's assume it's not a big, big number. How many on the hard side? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is my experience as well. The releases are hard. The getting to production is always problematic. It always, all hands on deck, is the long calls, it's some last minute problems, uh, it's um, fixing the issues, it's getting everybody, calling the experts and so on. So continuous delivery says that if something is hard, do it more often. And again, going back to my running, I actually still hate it. I mean, this is the worst exercise that you can, you can do. But I can deal with it right now. I have the tools and I can have a stamina to go and run like twice a week. Uh, and the same with the releases, the same with the things that you want to do to your code and to, uh, to your process. When something is hard, when you do it more often, you either learn how to do it and it's not hard anymore, or you fix the issues which are making it hard. So it's becoming easy. If you do release once a year, if you do a release twice a year, and you find some problems, you're probably not going to spend too much time to fix them because it's happening only once a year. What's the point? But if you're doing this every week or every other week, then it's becoming a problem because it's becoming visible and it's rep repeatable. Um, so continuous delivery is about, is have, have few concepts. So first one is creating your deployment pipeline. So mapping all the actions which are coming from the beginning to the end. So from the moment where you have the developer or have you write the line of code, going through all the stages up to the, or down to the production when the customer sees it, when it's in, in the customer laptop or in the production. It, it extends the concept of continuous integration. You are not really able to do continuous delivery if you don't have a continuous integration in place. Uh, there's lots of automation. It's actually all the, all the principles are talking about automate everything. Make sure that every step or every piece of the process uh, is automated as much as, as, po as possible. And the last one is the feedback. So you get the automation, you get the, you get the triggers, you get the actions, but you get the feedback how, to, how it went. So then you can automate the response to it. So it's not only doing the, you know, going one direction, but you're going also the, the, the reverse direction in the, in the automated way. Um, the, the development pipeline it's something that you can use some tools which are existing. This is an example of Jenkins, but uh, most of the places I, I, I met, it was some homegrown tools uh, where, you, where you build some dashboarding using your build systems. The Team City has some plugins as, as well. Uh, the, the important piece here is to make sure that you have one visual, one dashboard when you can see the whole process. So you can see from the beginning to the end. And then, these are the very simplified, this is the very simplified version of all the things which needs to happen. So there may be many permutation of it. But, uh, you know, in, in basically you have, you have to, you need to have those steps, right? So you need to change the code, then you're putting this into your version control, uh, you fire up the build, you get the results from your tests, you're doing some validation if it works or not, and you're going to production. You can have more steps during this time, you can have more uh, complicated process, but usually these are the, these are the steps which, which you need to do. Continuous delivery says, I can do it all the way uh, in the automated way, and I'm going to get the feedback on every step, and I'm going to see the data on every step, and I, I will be able to react. So with the deployment pipeline, you get the pieces in place, you get the information in place, and when something happens, you get the information back what happened, and you can react to it. And uh, on the bottom, you can see the different environments. Again, it's a simplified version. I hope you don't do local to production, so you don't deploy the production code from your local laptops. 
uh, but this may be a case in some projects. Uh, but usually you have more environments to, to cover. And again, if you do it often, if you're doing it at the same time, if you use the same procedures or the same uh, scripts to deploy it to your laptop, then to your testing environment, then, you, then to your production environment, you tested it. The, the moment it goes to production, it was already tested several times. But, uh, but you need to take care of the configuration, you need to take care of all the aspects from the continuous integration point of view uh, up to the point when it's in production. So, um, with my running, I, my ultimate goal was to lose weight. And I'm still working on it, as you can see. But um, when I was trying this for the second time, not the first time, I was running <clears throat> pretty often. And I was always hungry. And I ended up eating more. I ended up eating junk food and all this stuff. And, and I actually ended up with more weight than before I started running. So these are the things, because you know, when, you, when you talk about continuous delivery, it's easy to say, right? It's easy, it's easy to map those things and say, well, I'm going to automate everything. And then somebody will check in the code. And I'm going to see it in the production in several minutes. And if something goes wrong, I will know what went wrong. But it's not so easy. I mean, it's especially with the large teams and big projects and the complex environments, as well with the projects where you don't have those tools built in. So here are the, here are the anti patterns of continuous delivery. So no continuous integration or complicated continuous integration or not working continuous integration. No automation, no automation of tests. Uh, no automation of deployments, manual, manual production deployments. And sometimes it's coming from the fact that um, you just don't have a scripts to deploy to the production. But sometimes it's coming from, from the fact that your environment is actually different and are managed by different people. So while you can automate your laptop and development environments, when you go to staging and production, you actually need to hand it over to somebody else. And then, then it's becoming more challenging. And the last one is no data. So no information about what happened. No metrics to show you uh, if something went wrong or not. No metrics to describe your process, describe where you have a bottleneck, where you're wasting time, where something is actually working. So then you're working really on your gut feeling, not, not on the real data. So I try to talk about each of them a little bit. And I'm not going to go into many details, but hopefully we have some, some time for questions at the end if you want to uh, explore anything, any, any of those subjects. So starting with the continuous integration. The ideal mode or the ideal goal is to do everything on the main branch. So this, this, models, this model is, is really um, convenient, right? Because you have always the latest version on the main branch. The changes are incremental. They are very small. Every time you go to your home, home or local environment, uh, you get the closed version to what you need to do. Conflicts are happening very rarely. Um, and you are always ready to, to deploy, at least in theory. The, the example and the challenge that we had with this approach that it works when you have a small team. When you have a bigger team, you start seeing some, some problems. You start seeing many revisions. You start seeing the um, developers and you saying, well, you know, it takes me four hours a day to update my code and compile it on my, on my laptop before I, I'm able to add my, my features. The, the other problem is to maintain different customers with the different version of the code. So this is where you're starting introducing some complication. You're going to add the branching strategies you're going to release from the branch. Um, this is still pretty simple because you have a one branch for release and they should die before the next branch is created, uh, where hopefully uh, the, the, the changes from the main line are going to the, not going to the release branch, but every box that you fixing during the stabilization uh, going to the main line. The last one, and this is, this is, this is something which worked for, uh, for me in a few projects that 
even though the ultimate goal was to see how we can be as frequent and actual or current on the main, main branch, uh, we actually started doing the feature branch, branches. And you can call it the story branches or team branches. Um, and while it is not the perfect solution, it was sometimes the most practical one. So uh, it, was, it was helping to address two challenges. One is, one is, one is the technical one. So being able to finish the features which are bigger than small increments and have more people working on one thing on the branch without disrupting the, the main, main branch. The second one was a little bit more about the human nature. The, the, I don't know how about you, but people, they don't really want to show incom incomplete code. So they don't want to check something which is, well, maybe not, not perfect or maybe not something which is completed. So when you, when you, when you have the feature branches, it's something that, that helps to address this issue. And yeah, like I said, it's introducing some complication, but there are a few ways to control it or a few ways to, to help to, con to, to manage it. So, um, so first one is any changes from the main must be merged into the into feature ones. So your feature branch should be as current as the main one. <clears throat> and um, you will get the changes only when it's, when it's completed from the, from the feature branch and then goes to the main one. So the, when you go back, this is, this is where you get the updates about the, uh, what was happening on the feature development. Then they should be short-lived as much as possible. The ideally, it should be a few days. Uh, I mean, the, the most or the longer you should go should be the iteration. If you go further in the iteration, then it's becoming a nightmare. Then you're managing several branches and, and it's very difficult to, to figure out which branch is whose and what, which one is actual and so on. So number of active branches should be kept as minimal. Probably number of stories or number of teams is the maximum number of the current active stories. Uh, if you go beyond this, the, then something is wrong. The one thing which is not done too often is accepting the stories on the feature branch. So not only you complete your coding there, but also you're getting to um, have your testing done there. So from the continuous delivery point of view, you release from the, uh, well, you semi-release from your feature branch to your testing environment, and then you get the feedback about it. And when everything is okay, only then you go to the main branch. So then you're minimalizing the need for refactoring. You're still going to find the duplication. You're still going to find the, uh, some architectural things that need to really focus to solve. Uh, but you, you, when, you, when you're testing on the, on the release branch, sorry, on the, on the feature branch, then you have limited or smaller need, or lesser need for the um, config management roles or some technical architecture overview of uh, how it is done. Um, before I go to the test automation, on the, on the, on the release branching, um, the, 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 the project, the project which, which, which I was running, and I'm not going to mention a name because I see some people from this project in this room. Uh, you can ask me afterwards. Um, we, we went with the feature branching, and, <clears throat> and when you combine the feature branching, and we, we only combine with the feature branching with the uh, release branching, and then several different environments and se several different versions, we actually had to create full-time configuration manager role, because otherwise we couldn't really figure out how it's working. And this was, this was something which was a trigger to, uh, to say, well, that's probably too complicated. And uh, we are able to look at what is really needed. We are able to look at what are those, uh, from the release point of view, what, what we really need to, to do, uh, and, and simplify it to the point where every developer knew what to do. Every de developer uh, had a clear strategy on bra branching, and we, we didn't really have to go to some, so much complication. And this helps with 
all the other activities. If your if your continuous integration structure is complicated, everything else afterwards will be complicated. Um, test automation. So test automation goes like this: when you don't have any tests, you put some tests in, then you put some more. Your coverage goes up. Then you are able to get the feedback about how your code is working, so your quality goes up, and then everybody is happy. So how many of you actually experienced this cycle? Because in my 20 years of experience, it almost never goes this way. The, the more, the more, I have more examples on this strategy, I mean this scenario. When you introduce some tests, you build some more automated tests, and then, for some reason, they are becoming too complicated, so you stop maintaining them, and they starting to running slow. So people will stop using them, or will stop, um, or will start ignoring them. So the quality actually goes down. Uh, the other scenario which I saw was that, I mean, the first steps are the same, but then you're starting to get false positives. And this is even worse, because when your tests are slow, you can optimize them. You can, you can figure out why you're setting up to, you, too many resources in the beginning, or you can remove the duplications. But when you start getting false positives, then this is the, this is the sign that you need to do some serious refactoring of your, of your tests. So in one project, we said, we're spending too much time before the release. We get having too many defects. When we get all the changes, um, and we're trying to do non-functional testing, we're trying to go with the final cycles of, of preparation for the release, we're always ending up with the issues. So we wanted to shift it, like Agile sets, you know, with the TDD up front. So we put really nice framework to put some automated tested in, test, tests in. And, every, and, we, and we all agreed that every iteration we're going to do um, weekly builds, and we're going to run the whole suit, and then we're going to fix the issues beginning of the, of the week. In the worst weeks, the results from the test was investigated, the, the weekly tests was investigated till Wednesday or Thursday the next week. And 80, 90 percent of those was false positive. Of course, it was showing that we did something wrong with the tests. We coupled it with the other systems, we were depending on the uh, configuration that was, that was not correct, but the time that we spent to identify those false positives, uh, by the time that we when, we, when we got to the point where uh, we identified was the real issue, everybody was so fed up with testing that they said, they, they don't work. They, they, I mean, there's no point of doing this. I get everything read and then it turns out that I didn't break anything. So, to be able to fix it, you really need to be serious about your tests. It's, it's in my opinion, is something that you need to spend almost equally, um, almost the same effort or maintaining your tests and building your tests and on building your code. If you are not serious about it, one of those scenarios will happen sooner, sooner or later. Um, the other thing, and this is pretty cool about continuous delivery, that it says, test your tests. Um, put the test in your process that will trigger and will say something is wrong when there are no tests for the, for the story or for the piece of code. Um, and constantly see if the quality of your quality assurance um, is really at the level that they would like to, to have it. Because if you, if you don't, then you know, it's better to do manual testing than than maintaining the tests which are too slow and nobody trusts them. The, the next one is to really know what kind of tests you need it at each step of the process. So if you, if you build a really comprehensive and big suite of tests uh, which will check all your functionality and all your acceptance tests, and you try to run it every build, you're probably going to have a bad time. And this is something that we that, that I experienced as well because we had only one tool. Well, we had only one place to put the tests which we were focusing on, and we tried to use it for everything. We tried to use it for the unit testing, for the acceptance testing, for the smoke testing, for the deployment testing, and then it ended up to be 
not good for any of these activities. So make sure that when you're doing the unit testing, you get the results in minutes, if not in seconds. When you're doing your acceptance tests, you can do some more setup, but you're not running them um, at the points when you need to have a really big, quick feedback. Optimize them, remove the dupl duplication. Look at them at the point of how much I'm covering with this test. Do I, need, do I really need 12 of them? Maybe six of them will cover 80% of what I'm trying to test. Optimize it as you go. Uh, put the test for the performance of your tests. If your tests are running too, too long, then it's something wrong with your, with your process as well. Um, and the last thing, the last thing uh, from the continuous delivery I wanted to touch base is the short feedback loop. So this is something which, if everything goes well, and if you get those steps to, in the correct way, um, you are able to go all the way to the production and then get the feedback from the, from the production and decide what to do. And every, every, every action should trigger, every, every activity should be triggered with some action, and then you need to collect the information about how it went. And, and again, it's important to see it end to end because if you're focusing only on one metric and if you don't have the right information when you can see it end to end, you're going to optimize only for one thing instead of for uh, everything else. So one of the, one of the things I would like to share is we were looking into, we're, we're, feeling, we're feeling that it takes too long to, to, to go to, from the from the from the development to the to the testing and to the production, so what we did was to see how to um, how to optimize it. But when we are not looking at the end-to-end -end process, we optimize a lot from the development point of view. But then our production script was really the issues. So. We, we fixed the issues from the quality point of view, we prepared the configuration, but it really didn't shorten the whole cycle. So if you don't, don't see it end to end, you're going to focus only on, on a few things without optimizing the whole system. Um, why you need this feedback loop? So this is where, this is where it's becoming really cool uh, when you are able to action the correct behavior based on the feedback from what happened. And if you are able to um, go to the test and then see it failed, you are able to restore it to the previous state. And similar with the production. The, the, the ideal or the purest approach says that you go all the way to production and then production tells you something is wrong. So you can, so you can get the real-time feedback and then with, with this in mind, you, you are able to roll it back to the previous working version. Again, this is ideal world. Um, we try to do it with our build procedure. So I, I, I talked a little bit before about it. <clears throat> we had the project when we decided we had so many build issues, the build is broken almost every day. So we're going to be very strict about it. We're going to put the procedures, we're going to put the process. Uh, from now on, every change goes to the main branch. And if something is wrong, we're going to revert it back. We didn't, we didn't have the tools at the time. We didn't have our test suit strong enough to catch all the defects, but we had the build feedback. So the build will say, well, something is okay or something is wrong. When we tried to do it, we actually found out that rolling back the changes was taking more time than falling forward. So with all the changes coming in, all the revisions going to the main branch, we were spending more time on rolling back the changes than on trying to fix it. So what helped there, we put the rule in which says, if you're not able to fix the build within two hours, then we're going to roll it back to the previous version. And this helped us to get, get through this initial stage because uh, the moment when we had more tests, the moment where we had more automated uh, procedures where we could actually detect what was wrong uh, and then point it back to the exact, exact story or the code, it was much more easy to roll back the, this piece of the code which was, which was breaking the build. But before getting there, sometimes, sometimes you, you can't be really purist about it. But this is the ultimate goal. This is where you need to go from, um, from
from the feedback loop perspective. Um, I love this picture. I don't know about you, but I see it in the many offices, and this is this is a perfect illustration of the silos. So when you are a small group and you 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 are able to manage your scrums within one team, then it's easy. But when you're starting going bigger, then you're starting to see different roles, different teams, different organization. You have testing, you have development, you have operations. Operations is probably a good idea to uh, have separate for many different reasons, especially when you have the customers uh, on your production environment. But when you, the, the continuous delivery dashboarding and all the things that you see there is helping you to get away from, from this model. The model of silos are throwing things across the fence and having somebody else to worry about it. So when you're able to see which piece of your process is broken, then you can really go to the responsible party to fix it. And you can also have the whole team to look at this and, and see, well, it looks like this thing is always red. Why, why it is so? And, and it's more difficult to say it's not my responsibility to, to fix it. Uh, because you know this picture shows that ops team is actually doing something that they shouldn't, right? They're fixing development issues. Uh, because it should go back and should be rejected. If you, if you get your development pipeline working, working correctly, it will be not only visible, but will be automated. It will go back to the, uh, to the right party to fix it. Um, the other aspects of it, the other aspect of it is <clears throat> to, to make sure that when you uh, finish something, it, it's in the shape that is ready for the next stage. So you're not, not going to um, see too many things pushed down to the, to the, to the next party um, when they're not ready to take it. So, so with automated pipelining, you can have a team which is the next in the line to pull the data or pull the artifacts, pull the next build, pull the next package to work on it. So instead of saying, hey, I'm ready, now it's your problem, uh, it's, more, it's more about it's allowing you to do, now I'm ready, so I'm, I'm, take, I'm able to take more work because I'm done with my, with my, uh, with my, with my work. So, so going from, the, uh, from your process point of view, from the push to, from the pull to push, from the push to pull, uh, procedure is is much better. Um, now, how to get there? So, like like I said, I I, I was I was going through many different projects, and again, if you have an opportunity to starting start from something from scratch and you have a full influence on every single aspect of your process, it's easy. But if you don't, and if you have something which you acquired how to implement those changes, how to get to the stage where, uh, where, you, where you're going to get better. When I was trying to fix my running, when I was trying to figure out like a third time in the row what's going on, I tried to change my shoes, I tried to change the, the path that I'm, that I'm running, I tried to change the pace, I tried to you know, try different techniques, whatever. Uh, at the end, I didn't really know what happened. I didn't really know what, how it helped. I, I, I changed so many factors that I didn't know what is the influence on the process. So what, what, worked for, what worked for me and what worked for my project is to identify the problem, then find the metric which shows the problem, and the best way is to automate it, because then it's objective, it's not subjective. It's not my gut feeling that my build is too long, right? It's, more, it's, it's the concrete number, it shows it's too long. Um, then fix it, and, and then you're able to, you know, to move to the next thing. The one thing which, uh, which is really important is the second step, because this is very easy to be avoided or be mistaken. So you, so you think you have a problem and you're trying to fix it. So um, another example on this one, we, we, try to, we try to overcome some challenges with testing. And I'm talking lots about, lots about testing, but really, really this is, this is the, the core of the continuous deployment or even from the 
from the continuous integration. If you don't have a good testing and automated testing, it's, it's really difficult to do any, anything else. So this is why it is so important. But we thought we, it's taking too much time on testing. And the, we identified the problem that we have too many defects. So we try to fix it by putting more tests and by making more focus on, 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 on the quality of the code. And then we try to do more testing. And at the end, we ended up extending the cycle by two weeks. So in this case, we identified the wrong problem and we put the wrong metrics in. So we put the metrics on number of defects, we put the metrics on um, the cycle time or number of cycles, but we really didn't look at the whole period of time and that was the ultimate goal. What we are not doing this to have less defects. Of course, it was the, you know, the steps to get there, but the, we are doing this to shorten the period of time that it takes to, to go to production. And we didn't achieve the goal because the metrics was for something else. Um, the, the really nice thing about continuous delivery is that it allows you to and with this approach, actually, it is, is, is allows you to improve a little iteration by iteration. So when you focus on one thing and you put the metrics in, you're able to, to fix it and then go to the next step. Make it stick. Make sure that it's working. Don't move away from one change to another change before you see the results. Because, because pretty often, you're trying to introduce too many changes. You're trying to change your build procedure, trying to change your integration pattern, trying to do more automation, you're trying to do everything at once. And you, you don't really able to focus on one thing. Uh, the second thing is you need to make sure that what you did, it actually works and you can exercise it. You, you need to know your limits. You need to know your limits about your process and about your tools. So when you, when you do it for iteration or two, you can exercise it, you can see uh, that it's that it works and that you can move to the to the next thing um, this is something which is which is um, just an illustration what you can achieve if you do a very small improvement so example of your build is taking sixty minutes so if you improve it by one person it's how many it's three point six seconds right it doesn't feel big. It's just actually pretty easy to do. And in the first time when you're trying to look at this, you're probably going to do even more. You're going to do 10 percent or 20 percent. Uh, but then if you, if you add those percentages, at the end you're going to see uh, really good results. What is more important here, if you don't do it, your performance can decline. You can go down very quickly. Um, this is where you know, in the reverse situation, you look at your build, it takes 60 minutes. Now it's taking 61 minutes. Well, it's not a big deal, it's only one minute, right? But then if you don't watch it, if you don't put the measures in, if you don't see how to control the situation, and especially in the test area, uh, you're, going to, you're going to see a decline. And again, it's important where you're doing these things again and again. So. Uh, I ask you how many of you try to catch the tram and run. Everybody can do it. You know, if I take you know, one step here, it's, it's easy. But when you're trying to run for a marathon or for even 10K, if, you, if you're trying to run 10 kilometers, it's about 10,000 steps or even more. So this is a graph which shows my weight. So I started pretty high and then I tried to optimize it, as you can see. Uh, but it was... It was really, it was really um, good to see. Or it was, it, if you if you think about it, if if I going to carry one kilogram less, and I'm going to do it ten thousand times because I'm going to make ten thousand steps. Imagine how much less energy I need to spend to do it. How much easier it become. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend to do your continuous delivery for short sprint, for proof of concept, for, um, for the prototype. But when, but when it really works and it really pays off is when you're trying to have some sustainable increments and, um, and do the same thing again and again. If you're doing, 
if you're doing a release, um, if you're doing one release, if you have to push something to production, you can really run. You can going, you're going to catch this train, right? You're going to catch this tram. But if you want to repeat it again and again, uh, you need to know that you're not going to break something. You're not going to have your people leaving. They're not going to have you frustrated about the build time, about the testing, about not having the right information, uh, because then you are not able to exercise the tools and the processes that you have uh, to, to make it happen. So it would be cool to end up with you know, my picture, and it's, this is obviously not me, uh, but it would be cool to end up the presentation with my picture finishing the marathon. Um, I didn't do it yet. Maybe one day. I still hate running, actually. But um, what is really cool, I'm able to get out twice a week and run and improve my time or improve the, the, the length of the run, uh, and I can do it every week. And this is, this is really what the continuous delivery is about, uh, making sure that every iteration, every release, you get a little bit better, you have the right tools to do it, uh, and going back to the three things that are, that are important. So one thing is knowing your limits and knowing what you want to fix, so having a goal. I wanted to run for an hour. Now I want to do something else. I can move to the next goal. The, the second thing is having the right tools. If you don't have the right shoes, you can do it for some time, but you're not going to do it for a year. You're going to end up with some injuries. If you don't have the right build processes, you don't have the right uh, continuous integration tools, you're going to do it for a short time. You, you can make it happen, but you're not going to do it for a long run. And the last one, when you are stuck, ask somebody. Uh, ask somebody for a help. Make sure that Get, get some coaching in place and the right coaching because sometimes you need somebody to tell you, you know, you have everything good, you have everything right, all your things are in the right places. You just need to give it a little bit more time. Do it for one more iteration, do it for two more iterations and then see uh, if it works or not. So that's all from my, from my side. Uh, what question we have? We still have a few minutes, so if you want to, if you want to go into details on any of those subjects, please speak up or <clears throat> uh, contact me at gksaber.com. I'm here at the booth till end of the day, so feel free to, to ask me. There's a question. I think I got it. Maybe it will be easier. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, do you have some uh, automation guy in, inside the teams and he is responsible for automating the pipeline and so on, or rather devs are responsible for improving the process? So, so if I got the question right, was the, the question about who is responsible for uh, automating the process and then improving the process. Yeah, so, so the best results really is where the whole team is responsible for it. When you, when you, when you put something on one part of the team, uh, it's, it's usually more difficult to make it happen. So for example, with the test automation, the typical situation is if you have a large organization, uh, you have the QA organization, quality assurance or test organization. So the typical situation is, well, the quality is your responsibility. And while it's true, the, um, the best result is where you actually make the quality of the whole team responsibility. Maybe you can have one team which will say, this is the framework that we're going to work in. I'm going to put some automated scripts, I'm going to put some um, tools in place, but everybody has to contribute to it. So one thing that we did uh, with one of the projects was to, we, we, were, we, were struggling, we were struggling with this as well, because we, we had, I mean, our development team, there was a pretty big team, it was about 100 people from the development point of view, and they were adding a lot of new functionality in. When uh, we quickly realized if we don't do something about the automation of the acceptance tests, we're going to end up with a huge overlap or huge extension of the, of the acceptance, uh, acceptance period. And 
we couldn't really push it to the to the quality team. But what we did, we sit we sat together with putting some um, framework based on the existing uh, unit testing and uh, automation tests uh, together. So we ha we could have everybody adding the new test cases, and then. At the end, we, are, we, we had few people who were managing those test cases, but the whole team was contributing to it. Um, if, you see, if, you, if you have the right metrics and you have the right dashboarding, usually it's, it's good to have somebody who's going to maintain them, but then the, mm, figuring out what to do should be either a team exercise or should be a, something that you decide uh, together with, with everybody in the room. Because if you say, I'm going to do automated deployment, when you don't have a control over the deployment because it does by the, it's done by the operation team, it's, it's going to be very difficult. You're going to have this, you know, this throwing over the fence situation. So mm -hmm. as long as and as much as possible, I would say do it as a, as a whole team. I have one question referring to the slide with the uh, one, one percent improvement a day. Yeah. Do you have some metrics? Uh, actually, I'm curious about what, uh, what improvement are you talking about? Because uh, so test improvement, code improvement, so how, how would you like to measure that? Because it's, for me, it's really hard to, to say one percent improvement a day. What, it is very hard. So, so you know, um, I, I was talking really general about the improvement of the process, and and that's why when you have the continuous delivery in place and you have the dashboard and you have the metrics in place, you can decide which piece you want to optimize. If you want to optimize the whole cycle, then you can look at the, you know, how much my build is taking, how much my testing is taking, how much time or how much cycle I need to do of testing to, to go to release. And then if you, if you take a piece of each of this, uh, well, you know, you're not going to do one person a day. You're not going to one person iteration. But if you're able to do a little bit every iteration, then it sums up at the end and you get you, get you to the right results. Um, the, goals that we, we sub, the goals will be different for the different stages uh, of the project. So in the beginning, you know, when you get the legacy code or when you're starting, uh, you may set up some, some goals saying, I don't have any tests. If I be able to add 10 tests, test automated, automated tests by iteration, I'm going to get better. Then when you, when you have a coverage of testing, then you can look at your, uh, let's say, you know, optimizing the number of tests or num optimizing the time that is spent to, to, to execute those tests and then increase a little bit more. But, but the, but the, the really the message which I was trying to make there was to, you really need to look at to end. If you're looking only at one place, you can put 2,000 tests in and you're still not going to shorten the overall period, or overall, period or overall cycle. Uh, for me, the, the most important metric is always how fast I can get from the code to production and looking at the end, end, end to end. And then there are many things uh, in, in place to, to make it happen. Uh, and again, if you do it often, if you go the whole cycle often, you're going to see things which are going to start to frustrate you, annoy you. Because if you're doing it once a quarter, uh, you're probably going to miss some things. Or you're going to, well, you know, I spent two hours trying to figure out this, well, it's, it's not worth fixing it. If you're, doing, if you're wasting two hours every iteration or every, every day sometimes, uh, then it's becoming important to, to fix it. You can shout. <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> you? Thanks. Hi. Uh, let's assume that you are working on uh, some company where all uh, all user story has to be signed off. Uh, you have to de you have to de demo uh, all the stories. Um, how to implement a continuous delivery 
uh, in such organization. So, sorry, I didn't get the first part. So, all the stories are uh, just... It has to be signed off by business. Oh, okay. So, you have... Uh, yeah, uh, so, so this, is, this is more difficult case, right? Because this is your acceptance test. And, you know, I would, I, the, the typical answer that you will get is, well, get your business to do your fitness or do your, you know, acceptance test and go to automated tests so they can put some criteria in and, you know, they are incorporated to the, to the process. And I know it almost never happens. The business guys, they are, you know, they can put some Word documents, they can put some requirements, they want to click through things, but they, they're not going to, to work with your automated tests. Um, the, the one thing which, which you can do is when you have your deployment pipeline, you don't have to have all the things automated up front. You can, you can trigger some action and say, now from this point it goes somewhere and I'm waiting for the manual um, activity which is going to happen, but this activity needs to give me those information. And then it goes back to the, to the cycle. So even though it's not going to be you know, fully automated all the way through, you can still use the same dashboard and then you can start showing, well, you know, I, I'm waiting for the signature from you guys and it's slowing me down, right? Or this is not actually the issue because every time it goes there, it's, it's at five minutes and they're clicking through and, it, and it's done. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not easy to, to do it when you have the different specialization of the teams. When you have a one scrum team and you have the product guy sitting next to the developers, testers, and they can interchange and they can talk to each other and they can figure out what is the best to do. Uh, it's much easier to do. But when you have the developers, you have testers, you have operations, you have business analysts, you have product, you have delivery and so on, then you really need to get them to, to agree that this is the tool we're going to use and now I'm going to show some stati statistics and the metrics about you. But again, you can, I mean, ultimate goal should be to automate all of these things and have your business to buying if you have some contractual problems or customers or processes in the company which are stopping you to do it. Or you can, or if you must, you can leave some, some, some pieces of the process manual. Okay, thanks. There is one. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, how to enforce the culture change? Uh, in the team. Uh, recently I have seen a project in which testing all the suit of the test took half an hour, for example, and how to convince the team that it is worth to optimize it, because they are fine with that. They don't see any problem. They get used to it. Yeah, so, so um, the, the culture change is the most difficult one, right? So if I go back a few slides, This is, this, is, this is something which I, I would recommend. It's, it's um, when you're trying to do something and you feel like it's going to work and you feel like it's going to help, uh, it's very difficult to sell it. It's like, you know, it's obvious that my build should work faster. But if you, if you go to, I don't know, to testers or the, the ops guys or even to, some, to business guys, they will say, well, you know, why, why it's an issue? And then when you, when you are able to put the metric in, which shows what you're trying to do and have the whole team to, to agree to it, this is, this, is, this is the best result that you can get. If you, and, and pick one or pick, you know, maybe pick two. The, the, the problems that, they, that, that I made was that usually you try to optimize several things at once. And especially in the project when you have the challenges with the quality or the automation, you know that your build is not working, your integration is not working, your test automation is not working, deployment is not automated. How to fix all of this? You have the small goals for each one. Uh, the, same, the same way like working on your stories and you don't want to have too much work in progress, do it for your process. So work on one thing. Make, this, this, is where, this, is, this is where I'm sometimes challenging the guys through, through the retrospectives because we're going to the retrospective from the iteration, they're talking and they're saying, well, you know, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work. Okay, so let's work on these three things. The next iteration, we're going to the retrospective saying, well, this didn't work, this didn't work, and this is always the same things. Uh, and sometimes even three are too, too much. But if you, if you go with one, and we're going to, to put the metric saying, 
this is how it is going to help, or this is the thing that we're trying to optimize. And now I'm going to introduce this change and see if, it's, if it sticks or if it brings some results or some value. Um, this is how you can do it. We have three minutes for, before the break for a coffee, so we can take one more or we can go and get some coffee which could be useful after yesterday's party. Oh, there's one more. I can jump. Hi, uh, the question is about uh, continuous delivery. So uh, think of a client or clients that uh, because of the security do not allow um, direct of remote access uh, to uh, their even uh, uh, development or test uh, uh, environments. What have you ever faced uh, such a problem? And yeah. So, so this is this is a challenge with the local installs, right? So you you're shipping the code to somebody else, and you don't really have the influence on the last last piece. I mean, the deployment is done somewhere else, usually with somebody else, and it can be security reasons or it can be proximity reasons. It can be all kind of you know challenges to do it. Um, if you have only the, these customers, you're probably not going to automate the last piece. You're going to either provide the code with the scripts and make sure they, they're going to get it. Um, if you are able, it's good to have some metrics collected from them. And even if you are not able to connect and send it on the, I don't know, um, live basis, like a real-time basis, uh, it's good to get the information from them in forms of files or some batch files so you can get it back from them and see how it's working uh, in their environment. If you have the customers which are mixed or you have the mixed deployments, so you, you have a control of one and then you ship it to, to another one, I would still go and automate it for your data center when you have a control of it and then maybe put some recommendation and some consistent deployment scripts for the customers to choose if they want to use it. If, are they, if they're able to use it, then, then you can um, have a consistent uh, deployment procedures. If they have some, some challenges with this from the security point of view, or they have a different structure in their database, uh, sorry, not database, but data center, uh, they need to, need to differentiate and leave it as their responsibility. All right, thank you.